why knowledge is power and how it can change your life. First of all, what is knowledge? Knowledge is familiarity with someone or something. So, for example, if we have a person that we know is a car mechanic, we know that that person can fix broken cars or cars that are not working properly. So, if my car suddenly breaks down and I know a person who can fix that car, then I have knowledge of that person, which I can then contact and then get to fix my problem. It can also be knowledge about something. Let's look at an example where we have a child which sees fire, is curious about it, and then puts their hand over the fire, and they then hurt, and then they take away their hand. The child did not have knowledge about the fire. They didn't know that if they put their hand there, they would get hurt. So they were not familiar. While an adult, which has been through that experience and knows it, would not have touched fire, because the adult knows that if he touches the fire, then he's going to get burned. Knowledge is also facts, information, and skills. If I'm able to program a computer so it does a task automatically, and I don't need to do it manually. I have a website that I need to copy the data from, and instead of me going manually, select, copy, paste, select, copy, paste, and doing this on an Excel, for example, I can just write down code for a program, so the program automatically goes through it, the data, copies it, and puts it much faster. While I would need five minutes to do it, the computer can do it in 10 seconds, even less. So the skill I have programming is knowledge that allows me to perform tasks or solve problems. And knowledge is acquired through experience or education. In the example of the child, the child gained knowledge, acquired knowledge, that the fire burns if they put their hand there and it hurts, through experience. So you have to do something before you learn it. You can also acquire knowledge through education. You don't know how to program, but you would like to know how to program because it's a high-paying job and you can be paid a bigger wage, a better salary. So you go on YouTube, find a course, how to learn programming in one hour. You go through it, you learn it, and you suddenly have knowledge about programming like I have. You have just acquired knowledge through education. Happiness and suffering. So first of all, let's define happiness and suffering. Happiness is what you feel when you're able to achieve something you want to achieve, essentially any desire. Let's say I want to win a marathon. I train for one year running a marathon, two days or three days a week. After one year, I'm able to run a marathon then I run against 50 people, and then I win. I feel happy because I was able to achieve my desire, the goal I wanted to achieve. And suffering, it can be the opposite. Let's say I wanted to win, but then we did the marathon and someone else won, and I lost. Then I felt suffering, I was like, ah, I'm so bummed out, I didn't win. So we can define suffering as when you have unmet desires, when you're not able to achieve your desires. And Aristotle, a very wise philosopher from 2,000 years ago, he said, happiness is the meaning and purpose of life, the whole aim and end of human existence. And what does this mean? Well, for those wondering, what's the meaning of life? Why am I here on planet Earth? Well, Aristotle says that you're here to be happy, to have goals, accomplishments you want to achieve, desires, you achieve them, and then you feel happy. Okay? Because if you look back at the moments in your life where you felt the happiest, were probably the best moments of your life. While if you look back and see what the worst moments of your life were, would be moments where you felt the most suffering. 
For example, if you lose a child or lose a loved one, then that becomes quite a painful period in your life. And happiness, it can be quite ephemeral in its nature. And what does ephemeral mean? I didn't know this uh, two years ago, and maybe some of you also don't know what it means. But it just means temporary, something that is not permanent, something that uh, is in existence then fades away. Okay, So it could be... You know what I mean. Okay, And happiness it can be ephemeral, like let's go back to the example where I win the marathon. After I win the marathon, then I would be happy, thrilled for a while, but then days later I would not feel the same amount of happiness, right? It cools down the dopamine sensors in your brain, so then you feel normal, then you want to win again or win more, win something bigger, some, a bigger goal, right? But then you stop feeling happiness, right? You also look, see this in the um, rich people, right? They make certain amounts of money that they want to achieve, and after they're able to achieve them, they feel happy for a moment, but then they stop being satisfied, and then they want more, right? So this is how happiness is ephemeral in its nature. And this naturally begs the question if you can have happiness without the suffering. Because you cannot feel both at the same time. If you feel happy, you're not feeling suffering. And if you feel suffering, if you feel suffering, you're not feeling happy. Right? But what if you took suffering out of the picture? Right? If you didn't suffer when you put your hand on the fire. Let's say... All humans, when they put hands on fires, they don't feel burned, right? They don't feel suffering. Then it becomes normal. So it doesn't have so much value to be able to resist the fire, right? Because, let me be more precise. I didn't like this explanation. I'll give you a better explanation now. There's a person in the world that is able to walk through fire, right? Walking through the fire. They, something is burning up and then they can walk and they don't feel pain. Maybe they do, but they have uh, resistance so they don't feel so much pain. What they're able to do, it's a common party trick where they run over fires or put their feet and it doesn't and they're able to resist so it's impressive the people looking at it are not able to do it so it's impressive right there's value in that but let's say that suddenly everyone was able to do that then suddenly that person wouldn't be happy because they're able to do that because everyone else is able to do it right so then they're not happy anymore because there is no suffering, right? Everyone has it. Another example. When you go to the gym for one year, two years consistently and you get a good physique. You look in the mirror, mirror, wow, I look so good. It's valuable because it's something that is difficult to accomplish and not everyone is able to accomplish it, right? It's scarce. Scarcity is what gives value in economics and in every areas. But suddenly if everyone had good physics, they didn't need to go to the gym, it wouldn't be valuable anymore. So the person that was able to have good physique wouldn't feel happy anymore because everyone had it, right? So something needs to be difficult or needs to have suffering attached to it in order for happiness to exist. Because happiness, you can also define it as the absence of suffering. This brings us to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And this is quite the big concept. 
I tried uh, explaining it the first time recording this video and I took like 30 minutes <laughs> because it's so complex. But I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. It's essentially a framework, a tool that you can analyze to see what motivates human beings. At the bottom of the hierarchy you have physiological needs. These are air, water, food, sheep, not sheep, sleep, clothing, well, you have sheep in clothing, right? So maybe my brain was just thinking too fast. And shelter. These are like the foundation. If you have these, you feel happy. If you don't have these or you lose them, you feel very sad, suffering. And here you see the absence. You can also define suffering as losing resources, losing something you have. So if you have suddenly food, shelter, a good house, and uh, water, we feel happy because we satisfy these needs. But suddenly, World War III breaks out, and then a nuke hits my city, and then uh, it destroys my house. So I lose the house that I had, and um, I suffer. I feel suffering. At the next level, we have safety needs. And these are personal security, employment, resources, health, and property. Employment is what gives you revenue each month, money, that you can then use to pay for rent, to pay for food that you need. So it essentially provides the physiological needs. So the employment provides money that you can then use to satisfy the physiological needs. An interesting observation that maybe the each of the levels are able to provide the lower levels. And again, if you have an employment, but suddenly you become unemployed, you lose your job, you suddenly don't feel happy anymore. You feel suffering because you lost the source of revenue incoming each month that you need to pay for rent and food expenses, the physiological needs. The third level, love and belonging. So when you have friends, you're able to communicate with, share ideas, share experiences, you feel happy. I think it was Plato that said that humans are social animals, so they require social interaction in order to be happy. And if you suddenly lose friends or you're in quarantine, you cannot talk to friends like in COVID, then you feel suffering because you're losing what you had before. And same thing with the family. If um, you lose a member of your family, you suffer, right? So we see that suffering is essentially losing each of these um, needs on the hierarchy. If you go to esteem, respect, you feel happy when other people respect you and treat you well. Okay? But when people don't treat you well, they walk all over you, they exploit you, and they hurt you, then you're losing those elements and it causes suffering. And then we have the highest level of all, self-actualization, which is the desire to become the most that one can be. And I think I read somewhere that only about 2% of the population get to this level, right? And this can be the groundbreaking inventions that change human lives forever. Like the computer, the internet, right? The persons that were able to create it, they felt insane amounts of happiness. Tim Berners-Lee the person who invented the protocol and then the internet, when he sees everyone around him now using the internet, he feels very happy because he made the internet, right? Steve Jobs, after he creates the iPhone and people start using smartphones everywhere and he sees it, he feels insane amounts of uh, happiness because he was able to change human lives forever, right? 
it's the same with the politicians and the presidents. They're able to improve their country, make better working conditions. The founding fathers of America, when they signed the Declaration of Independence, making America an independent state from Britain, they felt very happy because they helped their people and changed the lives of the further generations that were going to come, that we now have. And this hierarchy is quite interesting and there's lots of genius in it because you're able to analyze where you are in the hierarchy. Do I have a girlfriend? No. Oh, I don't have uh, one of the needs I feel is suffering, right? But then you can ask, okay, so what do I need to do to get a girlfriend? I can um, become more attractive. I can uh, get a better job, have ambitions, and I can improve that need. And then I can meet a lovely woman that is attracted to me and I'm attracted to her. We get into a relationship and I'm now able to satisfy the love and belonging needs in the hierarchy of needs. And it can also be the same with employment. Like, okay, I don't have a job, why not? Let's find out what are jobs, what jobs are available on the marketplace. Then you find them, then you improve yourself, and then you get the job. So you patch what you're missing and you feel happy again. So it's why this hierarchy is quite genius. And the first time I experienced this um, concept, got to know it, was when I started university and a friend told me about it. I became, wow! This uh, just, just opened my eyes, right? Because before I was just walking through life on autopilot, right? I didn't know why I was doing some things and why I was doing other things. I just did them because I felt like it. But suddenly when I learned about this, I noticed, okay, I'm in university so I can get a job, so I can then get uh, revenue incoming in every month so I can pay for rent and expenses, so I can then travel. And this is in order to satisfy the physiological, safety, love and belonging, esteem and self-actualization needs. I see. Then with that knowledge I can make a better plan so I can achieve those goals. And this concept keeps coming in again and again for some reason. When I look at, when I'm reading books and they tell about hierarchy of needs in happiness, or when I'm in a lecture at university, in marketing and the professor tells about this pyramid that the best products and services are products and services that satisfy these needs, right? Good food, good uh, quality water, good quality shelter, buildings, everything. They've always been here since the start of time and they're always going to be here until the end of humanity. Let's hope that doesn't happen uh, soon. In a thousand years, 10,000 years, let's hope that. But yeah. And I have a hypothesis. I hypothesize that you can measure happiness based on Maslow's hierarchy, right? The more of Maslow's hierarchy needs that you're able to satisfy, the happier you become, the better life quality you have. And the less you're able to satisfy those needs, the more suffering you feel, right? When you lose your job, you feel sad because you don't satisfy the need for security and employment, which then gives you the physiological needs. And happiness is a family in this nature, right? After I get a job, I become satisfied, it becomes normal, then ordinary, and then eventually boring, right? Doing the same thing over and over again which then leads me to want to learn something new or do something more so I can feel happiness again, right? When I get the job, initially it's good, brings me happiness, but then it doesn't, so then I need to do something else to feel happy again, right? It's temporary and that's okay because life is an infinite game and not a finite game. An infinite game, let's start with a finite game first. So a finite game is like Mario killing monsters and um, fighting the dragon and then uh, saving the princess, right? When he saves the princess in the game, the game ends, right? It's a finite, so it stops and then you have nothing else to do. That's a finite game. 
An infinite game, on the other hand, Tetris, for example, you can play again and again for as long as you want. The blocks are always going to keep coming, always going to be resetting, over and over again. And life is this for humans, right? Humans are never satisfied. They always want more, always want to do more. And that's okay. That's actually what drives and what pushes humanity forward, which leads us to create more technology that improves our lives. Okay? If humans became satisfied, okay, you don't need to make more technology or improve ourselves or learn more about the reality we live in. Then eventually it would become life would become normal, nothing new, no innovation, no novelty. Then we become ordinary and eventually it will become boring, right? So 